Realm presents Tales Beyond Time, episode 12. Hello again, fellow travelers, and welcome back to Tales Beyond Time, presented by Realm. I'm Marco Palmieri, your host for another spectacular adventure. This week, we're bringing you a double feature of curious and, let's say, unsettling encounters. Our first story is by fantasy powerhouse Marie Brennan, winner of the Asimov Undergraduate Award and multi-time Hugo and Imagineer nominee. Nine Sketches in Charcoal and Blood, originally published in the fall 2007 edition of OnSpec magazine and narrated for Realm by Wallace Amand, features a sinister cast of characters vying for a collection of cursed objects. The townhouse of Richard Lowell was not one known to respectable members of society. In the wake of his death, an auction is held. Without further ado, I give you Nine Sketches in Charcoal and Blood. The townhouse of Richard Lowell was not one known to respectable members of society. He had entertained few guests during his life and hosted no social events, so all that was known of the house and its contents came through rumour and gossip, whispering of just enough scandal as to be fascinating. Thus, when word went out that Lowell had died, and moreover, had died without a will, an unprecedented opportunity arose to investigate the matter, through suitable intermediaries, of course. The public auction was set for May the 14th, and many a wealthy man instructed his gentleman factor to attend, there to observe and perhaps to purchase any oddities which might appeal. Lot 41, a clock, bronze with ivory inlay, decorated with figures of Egyptian deities, measures 31 hours in the day, showing here. A man from the auction house held up the clock, turning from side to side so that all in the drawing room might see it clearly. The piece was far from the strangest thing yet displayed that day. May I start the bidding at 20? Thank you, sir. 20 I am bid. 25, sir. Do I have 30? 30 from the lady on my right. 40, sir, very good. 50 from the lady. Do I have 60? 65, sir. The bidding stands at 65. Selling once, selling twice. Sold for 65. The servant from the auction house bowed to the gentleman in question and moved off to a side room where his purchase and the price would be recorded. The gentleman and the lady who had bid against him met each other's gazes across the rows of seated figures and the man nodded gravely to her in familiar salute. He did not look out of place in the room, with his elegant suit and his pale hair neatly smoothed. But to call her a lady was a kindness. She showed every evidence of having fallen on hard times. Her dark linen dress had been made over several years ago, with a fair bit of skill. But it was now both worn and out of fashion. Her appearance was not so poor as to forbid her entry to this auction but she did not look as if she had the wealth to bid on much, and she was so far the only woman to attend. Nevertheless, she sat with her back very straight, her dark head held proudly, as if unaware of, or unconcerned with, the attention of others. Neither she nor the other man bid in the next round, nor the one that followed, a statuette of a four-armed Hindu god and a collection of Roman coins in a pane of glass, went to two of the gentlemen factors without much in the way of fuss. Lot 44, a casket, silver, with vegetative and angelic motifs intertwined, possibly a reliquary with relic absent. Showing here, the bidding begins at 50. 50, madam, do I have 60? The auctioneer blinked. It was the only sign of surprise he had exhibited all morning. 100 from the lady in back. Thank you, madam. The two who had bid on the clock both turned in their seats to see who had bid so high. In the back of the room, a younger woman had entered during the auction of the coins in glass. Her golden hair was fashionably styled, and her blue dress was recent. She, at least, appeared to have the means to participate in this affair. She did not acknowledge the presence of either of the two now staring at her, but kept her eyes on the auctioneer who had continued his monologue with only the briefest of pauses. The bidding stands at 100. Do I have 110? 120 from the lady on my right. 150 from the lady in back. 160, now 70. 180, thank you, madam. Do I have 190? 
A tense silence ensued. Even the smartly dressed gentleman factors had unbent enough to wonder at this unexpected escalation. The shabbier woman was composed, her hand moving from her lap only to signal the auctioneer and, once, to brush an errant strand of dark hair from her face. The lady at the back, though, had grown tense, and her eyes were now locked on the silver casket displayed at the front of the room. Her expression was not that of a woman looking at a costly object. The bidding stands at 180 from the lady on my right. Do I have 200 from the lady in back? The dark-haired woman's face showed, very briefly, an odd kind of satisfaction. She did not raise her hand again. 200 I am bid. Selling once, selling twice. Sold for 200 to the lady at the back. Murmurs rippled through the audience as the dark-haired woman rose from her chair and proceeded with quick but dignified strides past the victor and out of the room. The main hall was a bare place, having already been stripped of the paintings that once decorated its walls. Perhaps the auction firm had feared they would disturb the gentleman factors, the woman thought ironically. She had not seen them in the listing of items for sale, which just went to show that the firm had no idea what they were handling. The paintings were harmless, twisted, but harmless. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. The younger woman had emerged from the drawing room. Elizabeth turned sharply at the sound of her voice, then turned away again, not speaking. I couldn't let anyone else have it. I'm sure you felt the same, but my reasons, I believe, outweigh yours. The younger woman gave a dry, unamused laugh. Relic absent, indeed. They're very lucky it is. Elizabeth spoke at last. This is more difficult than I thought it would be, she said softly, touching a bare spot on the wall where a picture had once hung. I hear you went to the funeral? Such as it was. I assume Nathaniel told you. Yes, he intends to be here later. Of course he does. A stiff silence followed. The younger woman was the first to break it. Do you believe he's really dead? We may as well assume so. Either he's dead, or he will never return to us. I see little difference. You can't know that for sure. The time for your optimism, Claudia, is over. Another dry laugh. Do you think it's optimism? I bought the reliquary to ensure no one will ever use it again. I intend to melt it down when I go home. If he should return, I would like not to be taken by surprise. Elizabeth shook her head. He won't. A knock sounded at the front door. Both women turned as a servant from the auction house opened it and took the coat and hat of the tall, thin gentleman who entered. The servant indicated the way to the drawing room, but the newcomer came instead to where the women stood. Ladies? Edward, Elizabeth said. I imagine we'll have the whole set by the end. All of us who still live, Claudia murmured. Edward raised his eyebrows. Are others here? Francis is in the drawing room, Elizabeth said, and Claudia says Nathaniel is coming. Have I missed anything of interest? The reliquary, Claudia said, and one of the clocks. I see. Edward accepted the auction listing from her and perused it. Nothing significant, then, until the flute, unless one of you wishes to bid on the astrolabe. Francis may have it if he wishes. Elizabeth said dismissively, for all the good it may do him now. I was under the impression we were here for nostalgia, not use. I am here for security, Claudia said, an edge in her voice. I've just paid handsomely for the privilege of melting the reliquary into bullion. Elizabeth's lips thinned to a tight smile. We are all here for security. But I do believe I shall go back into the drawing room, Claudia said. I wish to know who is bidding on what, even the unimportant things, also how much they are bidding. Perhaps I will learn what they're likely to bid at the end. Does it matter? Edward said. At the end, as you so obliquely put it, we shall all be bidding every penny we can afford, and likely more besides. It will be enough, or it will not. We shall merely have to see. Claudius sniffed at his response. You have become as tedious a fatalist as Elizabeth. With a rustling swirl of blue skirts, she turned and went once more into the drawing room. 
The steady, genteel drone of the auctioneer's voice drifted out into the echoing emptiness of the hall as the door opened and shut. Edward watched her go, then faced Elizabeth. You amaze me. I thought to find you and Claudia at each other's throats. My youthful enthusiasm for warfare has waned, she said dryly. Is that why you let her have the reliquary? If she cannot banish her nightmares without destroying it, then by all means let her do so. Else I may have her haunting my door, full of fears of what might happen, as if the time of such matters is not twelve years gone. She even behaves as if Richard might come back. Edward picked an imaginary bit of fluff on the sleeve of his coat. What did happen to him? I've been on the continent these last years, you see, and only recently returned, so little news reached me, other than that he had passed and the circumstances were somehow peculiar. When did he ever do something in the ordinary way? Elizabeth glanced at the door the servant had vanished through after admitting Edward, then moved further down the hall. They found some few remains that might or might not once have been part of his body. Those were buried three days ago. Also found were such evidences as held little meaning for those who came upon them, but which, from what I have heard of them, indicate that he was attempting to take up the old ways again. Or had never abandoned them, Edward said, supplying the words Elizabeth had left unspoken. And now, Elizabeth said, the vultures gather to pick over the possessions he has left behind. She shook her head. I did not expect to mourn their loss so much. Another knock came at the door. Both of them watched as a pair of unfamiliar men were admitted. They hastened into the drawing room, looks of greed and guilty pleasure on their faces at the thought of owning some of the scandalous treasures of so notorious and eccentric. When the hall was silent again, Edward said, It is the past you mourn, and not its outward trappings. As if he had not spoken, Elizabeth said, They will open the bidding on the flute soon. We should go back in. She moved down the hall toward the drawing room, her back rigidly straight, maintaining dignity against the stripped nakedness of the walls, the tawdry spectacle of a public auction. Elizabeth, Edward said as she reached for the handle of the drawing room door. Why are you here? I don't believe that dress is a costume. You have little money to your name. I imagine we all will risk more than we can afford here today. But for you, the bottom of your purse will be reached much sooner. Are you simply here to see how it ends? She turned her dark head just enough to give him the cold, diamond-hard look he remembered from before. Then she went into the drawing room. Some things, he reflected, did not change after all. And he followed her in. He saw that Claudia had seated herself at the front of the room, near but not next to Francis Elliot's pale, familiar head. Elizabeth was on the other side of the aisle between the chairs, and well back. Edward chose a seat for himself about level with her, but behind Claudia and Francis. They might all have been friends once, of a sort. Perhaps it would be better to say colleagues, but not now. The flute came and went. Edward bid on it, but half-heartedly. It went to Francis in the end. Senseless, really, to spend money on lesser things, yet they were all doing it. Nostalgia played a larger role here than any of them were willing to admit. The lots passed one by one. Francis purchased a gold pendant set with lapis. Claudia purchased an Egyptian scroll. Nathaniel came in, a bony figure in a dark suit, and sat next to Claudia. The two of them leaned their heads together and whispered briefly. Francis purchased a Japanese box. Francis purchased a three-faced figurine. How much money did the man have? Edward found himself bidding on a set of scarabs from a royal tomb, which he did not care about in the slightest, simply to prevent Francis from winning yet another item. He scowled at himself in disgust and went back out into the hall. He nearly ran down a short, portly fellow who was about to enter the drawing room. I see, the man exclaimed, and then each recognized the other. Edward! Charles said as the door swung shut. I'd say, what a surprise to see you here, but it isn't. Have others arrived? Edward nodded. Francis Elliot and Nathaniel Hollis are both inside, and Francis bidding as if he had the royal treasury at his disposal. 
He always was profligate, Charles said. But Edward saw his round eyes narrow slightly, taking in this information. No doubt weighing it against how that might influence Francis at the end. Just the two of them? Also both of the ladies. This time the reaction was decidedly visible. Elizabeth Adams is here? There were but two ladies in our circle, Edward said, watching him, and neither seems to have transformed herself into someone else. Yes, she's here. I shouldn't expect her to show herself at an event like this, Charles said. Why not? She seems short on funds, but she was one of our number. The only ones I don't expect to see today are Jonathan and Lowell himself, and even then I allow for a chance of that. Who says death can be trusted to keep them away? Charles nodded, but his eyes were on the drawing room door, as if he could see Elizabeth through them. True, very true, but I have heard the oddest things about her. Odd, Edward repeated, and waited. Charles was still the man he had always been, with a chronic need to talk of what he knew. Oh, nothing specific, merely that she is working for others, yet no one seems to know who these others may be. They must not pay her well, these mysterious others of hers. Or perhaps she does not wish to advertise her means. When one looks poorly, no one asks why, it isn't polite. But if one shows wealth, then people will inquire, if not directly. They will find out where one's money is coming from. She was always very cautious. I doubt she has changed. Edward doubted it as well, yet this seemed an elaborate explanation for a simple situation. Which was more likely? that Elizabeth was employed by mysterious figures who paid her well, but hid her wealth, or that she had fallen on hard times, or some mixture of the two. What sort of work do they say she does? Charles waved one hand airily. Skullduggery of some sort or another. Elizabeth? Skullduggery? Yet she always had been very practical. And what was she doing here today? Someone knocked on the front door before he could ask Charles more. Edward did not wish to continue this particular conversation in front of a stranger, and even less did he wish to continue it before the familiar figure who proved to be at the door. Gregory! Charles leapt forward, all smiles, and clasped hands with the newcomer even before the servant could take away his hat. How wonderful to see you! I believe that's all of us, then, except, of course, for Jonathan and Richard, as Edward had so recently pointed out. Ha <laughs> ha, what a sight that would be, eh, if they joined us? Quite a sight indeed, Gregory said, in exactly the level tone he'd always used in response to Charles' grating cheer. Edward gave him a stiff nod. Gregory? He received a stiff nod in return, from a head gone white long before its time. Edward remembered the night it had happened, too and did not appreciate the unintended reminder that Gregory Cabot was not a man to be trifled with. Ought to move on in, I should think, Charles said, looking at the auction listing. Missed quite a few things already, and we're coming up to the end soon enough. Wouldn't want to be standing out here chatting when that comes around now, would we? It'll be quite a show, I should think. Edward, watching him closely, revised his opinion of a moment before. Charles would never make his fortune at cards, but he had grown better at dissembling. Beneath his veneer of empty chatter, he was wary of Gregory, as were they all, and with good reason. Even Lowell had been wary of him, but this seemed something more. What else did Charles know, or suspect, that he was not saying? A cold thread of worry crept up Edward's back. Gregory gave no sign whether he had noticed Charles's wariness or not. I am not sure we could fail to be present when the time comes. Charles laughed, but there was a ragged edge of tension beneath it, not quite completely obscured. Come now, do you truly believe it? The white-haired man did nothing more than meet his gaze, but the joviality drained from Charles's face. Of course he believed it. Gregory, of them all, would not delude himself into thinking they were not at risk. Elizabeth might be mourning the past, but the past was not entirely dead. The thread of worry grew colder. The three of them went into the drawing room and parted ways inside the door. Edward returned to his former seat. Charles scanned the room, shifting from foot to foot as he spotted the others one by one, before dropping himself into a chair next to the aisle, away from everyone else. 
Gregory settles himself in just behind Elizabeth's right shoulder and murmured a brief greeting in her ear. His entrance had not gone unnoticed. At the front of the room, Nathaniel turned back around in his seat and scowled. I was hoping he would not show. Claudia sniffed. Gregory, stay away. Not likely. He'll have some scheme, though. He always does. I should have killed him years ago. Nathaniel brooded as a small bust of an unknown serpentine god was sold. Claudia seemed serene, but her fingers, wrapped around her reticule in her lap, were tense. There were not many lots left, now. You realise, she said to him a moment later, her voice a murmur too low for the nearby Francis to hear, that if we all truly wished to be secure, we would pool our resources and ensure that no one in this room would be able to outbid us. Then we could decide amongst ourselves how to dispose of it. We don't trust one another enough for that. No, we don't. So we bid separately. And if our luck is anything like it was twelve years ago, none of us will win. Claudia glanced at him sideways. I don't suppose you and I... No, Nathaniel said curtly. And they sat in silence as a shrunken skull came up for bid. The day was drawing to a close. The light in the room was fading. Servants came in to tend the gas lamps as the auctioneer sold off, one by one, the remaining items from Richard Lowell's estate. The audience thinned out. Many of the gentlemen factors, having bid on and won or lost those items which their masters had sent them to acquire, departed. Others remained, however, some with their purses hardly touched. Lot 99, a leather-bound book containing nine sketches in charcoal and red pigment, depicting unknown subjects, showing here. The man from the auction house held up the book, turning the pages slowly so the audience might see. In the glow of the gaslight, the images seemed almost to shift. Several of the men watching leaned forward in their seats, attempting to make out the subject matter of each sketch. But it was impossible. The mind, it seemed, would not hold them. But they were compelling, almost mesmerizing. One wished to look more deeply into them, as if some wondrous secret were contained therein. The red pigment was of an odd shade, perhaps a trick of the light, and those closest to the book could discern a faint, unpleasant smell. Elizabeth murmured over her shoulder to Gregory in a nearly inaudible voice. I have done my part and risked much in doing so. You had best not fail me. The white-haired man did not respond. May I start the bidding at fifty? The auctioneer said, and blinked for the second time that day at the hands which shot up around the room. Not a single person present had not bid. One hundred? The hands rose again. One hundred fifty? The price rose and rose and rose. One by one, individuals began to drop out. The first to go were the men near the back of the room those furthest from the book. None of them departed. The tension in the room was as palpable as it was unexpected. The servants hired for the day exchanged glances of astonishment. Far more valuable objects had gone for far lower prices that day. But the book held a strange fascination, and the seven individuals who had known Richard Lowell exuded such an air of tight-lipped determination, even desperation, that others could not help but feel it. Two. One thousand, the auctioneer said, and murmurs of shock disturbed the taut atmosphere. The bidding stands at one thousand. Do I have eleven hundred? Claudia raised her hand, and the bidding went on. An oddity began to touch the proceedings. The bidders began to drop out in larger numbers, even before they reached the limits of their purses, and yet it did not seem to them a natural consequence of the unnatural escalation of the auction. The book could not possibly be worth a tenth of what they were bidding, but still, they craved it, and that craving warred against a pressure that strengthened the more they persisted. The air grew close and hot. More than one gentleman in the room mopped uselessly at his face with a handkerchief. Soon, only a handful were left, and then only one. He struggled to raise his hand in response to the auctioneer, but turning his head as he did so, locked eyes briefly with Gregory Cabot. The man's face paled, his hand dropped swiftly to his lap, and it did not rise again. Now only the seven individuals were bidding. When it became apparent that no others would interfere, 
Elizabeth folded her hands in her lap and watched silently. She exchanged a single glance over her shoulder with Gregory, which the others did not see. Their eyes were fixed on the book. The strange pressure that had laid itself on the room was still manifest. Charles Quincy, sweat-soaked and wild, ceased to bid. Five were left. Francis Elliot dropped out. Four. Then Edward. Then Claudia. The remaining two men might have been carved from stone, so hard were their expressions. Nathaniel Hollis's bony shoulders hunched as if straining against a great weight. Gregory Cabot sat upright, but stiff as steel. Neither moved except to increase their bid. No one else breathed. The bidding stands at 3,600, the auctioneer said. His voice shook slightly as he went on. Do I have... A muscle clenched in Gregory's jaw, casting a sharp-edged shadow. He signed to the auctioneer, and the air of the room hardened to diamond. Five thousand, the auctioneer whispered. He licked his lips and summoned his professional composure to repeat it. Five thousand from the white-haired gentleman. Do I have five thousand one hundred? Claudia stared at Nathaniel as he trembled in his seat, hands clenched into white-knuckled fists. Her eyes flicked desperately from person to person in the room, disregarding the strangers, but picking out Francis, Charles, Edward. Elizabeth sat perfectly upright, her expression mask-like. Only the rigidity of her neck betrayed her inner state. But she was sitting with Gregory and could not be looked to for help. Nathaniel shook his head and slumped down, defeated. And the pressure lifted. The auctioneer swallowed. I have 5,000. Selling once, selling twice. Sold for 5,000. Claudia buried her face in her hands. The auction was completed. Gregory rose to settle his accounts. So, one by one, did the others. The gentlemen factors and the men from the auction house shook themselves free of the strange atmosphere that had prevailed during the final lot. Too much time in a stuffy room, they told themselves. They would be glad to get out into the air, return to their own homes. Odd business, that, but it was already fading from their minds. Not so with the others. When they had arranged for those items they had purchased to be sent to their homes, they returned to the front hall to find Elizabeth waiting. Gregory would like to speak with you all, she said. Upstairs. No one objected to them going deeper into the house. No one seemed to notice them going. The third floor room was empty, stripped absolutely bare, and no gaslight had ever been installed there. Elizabeth lit candles and placed them in holders that she had brought, then scattered them around the room so they might have light. There were no windows. The room lay empty, but the smells remained. Faint, but they reached deep into the mind of each person and called up memories that had not faded at all in twelve years. You should have worked with me, Claudia hissed at Nathaniel, shaking with fear. We could have defeated him. Don't be a fool, Francis said. Didn't you feel what he was doing? And you, Claudia spat, gesturing at him contemptuously. Spending all your money on insignificant trinkets. You are a cretin, as you always were. Francis shrugged peacefully. I like them. They're pretty. Pretty, Charles yelped. How can you think of a thing like that when... But his voice was cut off abruptly. Gregory had arrived at last and closed the door behind him. Each of them stared hungrily at the book he held. Unperturbed, he crossed the floor to stand at the far wall, the position Lowell had always claimed for himself. The significance was not lost on them. No, Gregory said into the breathless silence of the room. We finish this. Edward gathered his composure and said, What do you intend to do? He's got a plan, I'm sure, Charles said. His voice was ragged and unsteady, all pretense of calm gone. He always does, bloody schemer. What are you going to do to us? From where she stood at Gregory's right hand, Elizabeth said, He's going to set us free. Her words produced an instant silence. They stared at her, now, Attention briefly off the book. You can't be serious, Claudia said at last. 
Elizabeth met her gaze levelly. Have you ever known me to be frivolous? I don't trust you, Charles said, his voice still wild. You're up to something. I know it, you- Her voice cut across his. Trust is irrelevant. You will cooperate or you will suffer. We are all bound to that book. We may have tried to deny it. Twelve years is time enough to convince oneself that it is mere fancy, but I'm sure the sight of it has undone that illusion. We are bound to it, and Richard would never have released us. He was bound to it too, Edward said, as much as any of us were. He said release was impossible. Elizabeth raised one eyebrow at him. And you believed him? Gregory spoke again at last. Richard was bound, yes, but that was a price he was willing to pay, for the power this book could give him over us, should he but learn to use it. You see, we must all be released, or none can be. Claudia put one slender hand to her throat, eyes wide with sudden hope. So, Gregory said, I have the book. I also have the knowledge necessary to use it against any of you. I trust my demonstration during the auction has made it clear that I have not forgotten the old ways. My intentions, I assure you, are benevolent. How the hell are we supposed to believe that? Nathaniel demanded, his voice shockingly loud against the room's bare walls. You stand there and admit that you haven't given up the old ways. Do not, Elizabeth snapped, inflict on us your hypocrisy. I know what your intentions were, Nathaniel, and what your recent habits have been. Her eyes were cold as ice as she glared at him across the rough circle they had instinctively formed. I know how we would have fared had you acquired the book. Claudia edged away from him. As I was saying, Gregory continued, my intentions are benevolent. I wish to release us all from this bondage but it cannot be done without your cooperation. As it is in your best interest to obtain release, you will provide me with that cooperation. He paused to let them consider his words. Are we in accord? One by one, they murmured agreement, Nathaniel last of all. Then let us begin, Gregory said. They started with the first page. What Gregory asked of them was not complex. Compared to some of their past endeavours, it seemed almost trivial. And yet not a one of them was unmoved when the image on the first page shifted and resolved itself into a portrait of the late Richard Lowell, drawn in charcoal and blood. They moved next to the eighth page, for Gregory wished to begin with those of their number whose mortal bodies had passed on, but who were still trapped in the pages of the book. Soon Jonathan Matthews' face gazed out at them. Then, page by page, through the rest of them. Nathaniel came last and tried to argue the order, but no one took up his case. At last, all nine of the portraits were transformed, stripped of their protective disorder. The seven surviving members of their old circle each felt naked before the knife, their souls exposed on the pages of the book. We have opened the door for each other, Gregory said when they were done. Now we end this. And, stepping to his side, Elizabeth lifted the candle holder no one had seen her pick up and lit the book on fire. The pain was instantaneous. Even Gregory's will could not maintain his hold on the book. The burning volume fell to the bare panels of the floor, where it flamed without scorching anything else. Claudia soon followed it, crumpling into a heap of blue skirts and golden hair. One by one, the others collapsed around her. Elizabeth held on the longest, but in the end she too fell, shrieking until she had no breath left. And the voices of the others joined her both the living and the dead, blending into a single, agonizing scream. Then silence, as the flames died out, the pain ended, and each could breathe once more. Nathaniel shook his head to clear it, on his hands and knees. Then, faster than thought, he threw himself at Gregory, but not quickly enough, for Elizabeth was there with a knife at his throat. I will kill you 
she said softly to Nathaniel, and everyone believed it. Gregory, behind her shielding arm, rose to his feet. We are concluded, he said. You are all free to go. He looked down at Nathaniel, who glared at him with crazed eyes. If you should wish to attempt some working against me in the future, you are free to try, but I would advise you not to. I know what path of study you have followed of late, and it will not avail you. Your soul is your own again. Be grateful for it. Charles was the first to go, stumbling out the door and down the stairs. Francis Elliot picked himself up, straightened his clothing, and offered a bow to both Elizabeth and Gregory before departing. Elizabeth kept her knife out and her eyes on Nathaniel as he backed a few steps away, but she spoke to Claudia. You may melt the reliquary if you wish. It isn't necessary, though. I've been looking forward to it for twelve years, Claudia said. Why should I pass it up? Don't be an imbecile, Nathaniel. Come away. She took him by the arm and all but dragged him from the room. Now only three remained. Edward looked at Elizabeth, standing at Gregory's side, and thought about what Charles had said regarding skullduggery. You two seem to have been remarkably well prepared for this, he said. Elizabeth gave him her driest look. You need not resort to insinuation, Edward. If you are implying his death was not an accident, you are correct. The knife was still in her hand, and her eyes were cold. Well, Edward reflected, she always had been a practical woman. My thanks to you both, then, he said. I do appreciate having my soul back. We were fools to ever try that kind of madness. He glanced down at the tiny dusting of ash, which was the only remnant of the book, and shaking his head, made his way to the door, where he paused. If Nathaniel does try anything, he stopped mid-sentence, looking at the two of them. Gregory with his unnaturally white hair, Elizabeth with her perfect posture and the knife in her hand. They could handle Nathaniel. He tipped an invisible hat to them both. Farewell. Then he left the third floor room for the last time, descended the stairs, and went out into the night. I don't know about you, but I'll think twice before checking out any garage sales. But don't tune away just yet, gentle listeners. Our next offering is by acclaimed fantasy author Brian Staveley, Gemmell Award winner and a finalist for the Goodreads and Locus Awards. His story, The Log Goblin, originally published in 2015 on Tor.com and narrated for Realm by Neil Helligers, is a creepy but heartwarming little winter's tale. Someone has been stealing wood from a man's firewood pile. On a cold night, he figures out who and why. Please enjoy The Log Goblin. I was a little sad to take down the huge old beach, a wolf tree three times as large as anything else around. Most likely it stood there when the woods were fields, a marker between properties or just a spot for the cows to graze out of the sun, and it had remained after the farmers left and the fields gave way to forest once again. It seemed a shame, somehow, to cut it down, but it was dying, and besides, a tree that size was worth more than a cord of firewood. By the next winter I had it cut, stacked, and dried inside my shed, but it was buried near back behind three other rows, and it wasn't until January that I'd burned enough of the other wood to actually get at it. That's when a strange thing started happening. At first I thought I was imagining it. I'd go out to the shed in the morning, and the stack of wood would look lower, as though someone had come in the night to steal the logs. It seemed crazy. Who would drive a mile down my rutted driveway in the middle of the night just to make off with an armload of firewood? I told myself I was imagining it. But when you rely on wood to cook your food, to keep you warm, to stop the pipes from freezing, you know how high your pile is, almost down to the last log, and someone, I decided after three more days of this, was taking my wood. I caught him the next night. I stayed up late, waiting inside until full dark, then pulling on my coat and boots to go stand guard. It was cold enough that the snow squeaked. 
The stars were knife sharp. I waited with my hands stuffed in my pockets, shivering and feeling foolish. I was about to head inside when I heard him coming, huffing and cursing and muttering as he made his way up out of the woods, struggling through the deep drifts toward my shed. It was obvious at once that he was a goblin. I'd never seen one, of course. They weren't supposed to be real, but what other creature is greeny, brown, pointy-eared, and knobbly-fingered, barely taller than my knee? I watched, amazed, as he hopped up on the stack of wood, dragged a single log off the top, and headed off back into the snow, dragging his spoils behind him. I'd never noticed his tracks, but then it had been snowing off and on for days, and the wind had been blowing to beat the band. I'd planned to confront the thief. But instead, I found myself following him out into the woods. The moonlight through the pines was bright enough to see by, and it was easy to follow the goblin. The log, almost as big as he was, slowed him down. He carried it on his humped little shoulder, mostly. Sometimes it would slip off and drop into the snow. He'd dig it out, kick at it irritably for a while, then pick it up again, forcing his way deeper into the forest. The slashes of shadow and moonlight made everything look strange. I lost my bearings for a while, but when we finally started climbing up a gradual hill, all at once I knew exactly where we were, and I knew where we were going. There, at the crest of the rise, like a round wooden table poking through the snow, was the stump of the great old beech tree, and there, piled in front of it, was my firewood dozens of split logs arranged in some sort of insane scaffolding. I watched from the woods as the goblin entered the small clearing, approached his hoard of firewood, and, with surprising care, placed the fruits of his latest thievery on top. It was an oddly reverential gesture, after all the kicking and the cursing. Another night I might have waited longer, watched more, tried to understand what was happening. Despite the long walk, however, I was cold and tired, and as the goblin turned away from his pile, heading back for another log, I stepped from the shadows. Why are you taking my wood? I asked, somewhat mildly given that I was the one who had been wronged. He jumped into the air, then bared his crooked little teeth and glared at me. Your wood? Your wood? My wood, I said. I own this land, I cut down the tree, I bucked it, I hauled it out and split it for the winter. My wood. It was, I thought, an argument that would stand up well in any court of law. But the only judge or jury in the clearing that night was the bright silent moon, and the goblin just made a sound like a growl in his scrawny throat. Killing a thing, he declared. Don't make it yours. It was dying already, I protested. So are you, he said, stabbing a finger at me. Doesn't mean I come in your house at night to chop you down. I frowned, suddenly all turned around by the strange conversation. Are you claiming that the tree is yours? What I'm claiming is that the tree matters more to them that's buried beneath it than it ever did to you. I blinked. There's a body? Two of them, he snapped impatiently. They courted beneath the beach as kids, made half their babies here, said everything that needed saying to each other under the old branches, and they're buried. He stabbed a stick straight down, gouging at the frozen ground. Right here. The tree is theirs, even if it's dead, even if it's all chopped up, and it ain't your place to go steal in the fire. But they're dead too, I said unsettled to discover these unmarked graves in the middle of my land. And you think the dead don't want to be warm? He raised the thicket of his brows in disbelief. I stared at him, then shook my head. Why do you care? He looked at me a while, then back to the pile of wood he'd made. I like the way she sang, he muttered. When she was in the fields. She sang even when she was alone, like she knew I was there. And him, he nodded at the memory, when he went out with a bucket for berries 
he always left a bush unpicked. For the birds, he said. But I figured he meant me. Then he was quiet for a long time. We both were just sitting there like we'd known each other all our lives, like I hadn't just caught him stealing from my pile. The ground looked so cold. All right, I said finally. I'll help you haul the rest of the wood. It took most of the night, and both of us were wiped when we finished. The pile was pretty haphazard, but it was good wood, that old beach, and it was dry. I only had to light one match, and it went up like kindling. We sat on the stump, it was wide enough to hold the both of us, and watched the sparks fly up, small as the stars, but hot enough to burn. What were their names? I asked, gazing into the fire. Leave the names alone, the goblin snapped. I turned to him, taken aback. I thought I might place a gravestone here now that the tree is gone. What do they need a gravestone for? He gestured with a gnarled hand. They got a fire. But a fire, I said, shaking my head. It's so short. He looked at me, then held his twiggy hands out to the flame. But it's warm. Leaves you all warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? Just me? Well, if you're ready for more, check out Roanoke Falls, executive produced by John Carpenter and Sandy King Carpenter. Something is punishing the people of Roanoke with blood. If you have sinned, beware. Or maybe give Dead Air a try. A true crime podcast host is roped into a decades-old murder when someone calls into her show with a staggering reveal. The person who went to prison for the crime didn't do it. Both shows are out now and available wherever you get your podcasts. So until next time, whatever dimension you're in, safe travels. You're listening to Tales Beyond Time, created and produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Tales Beyond Time, episode 12, features nine sketches in charcoal and blood written by Marie Brennan and The Log Goblin, written by Brian Stavely. It is produced by Mary Asadolahi and Marco Palmieri. Associate produced by Alexis Latshaw and executive produced by Molly Barton. Hosted by Marco Palmieri and performed by Wallace Hammond and Neil Helligers. Audio produced by Tide F Studios and Spoken Realms. Additional editing by Nicholas Papaleo. Cover art by Kendall Thomas. <laughs>